Our understanding of molecular geometry in introductory chemistry is mostly informed by Vesper theory, this idea that bonding and non-bonding electron pairs want to get as far away from each other as possible. And there are actually a relatively small number of ways to do that, and it's based on the number of electron pair domains, or what I like to call the steric number, around the central atom. If we know the st steric number, that implies the geometry. Things are a bit more complicated in a coordination chemistry context. But analogous to Vesper theory, geometry is primarily based on the coordination number of the complex, the number of dative bonds formed to the metal center. However, for certain coordination numbers, there are multiple possible geometries. So coordination number doesn't tell us the whole story, but does give us a lot of insight into complex geometry. In general, there are three factors that affect the coordination number and consequently the geometry of a complex. And the first is the size of the central metal ion or atom. Consider palladium versus nickel. Palladium and nickel are both in the same group, but palladium is in a lower period than nickel. So palladium is larger than nickel, pretty much across the board. This means that more ligands can fit around the larger palladium atom than the smaller nickel atom, and the same idea extends to their ions, of course. So for complexes of similar or identical ligands, nickel's coordination number is often smaller than that of palladium. Now, the sizes of the ligands also matter. Very large, very bulky ligands that take up a lot of space tend to be associated with lower or smaller coordination numbers. So consider, for example, phosphine, PH3, which is a phosphorus analog of ammonia. These H's are very, very small. This tritert-butyl phosphine has three groups that are very, very large. These are three carbons each of which has three methyl groups branching off of it. So this doesn't really do it justice, but this whole collection of atoms is very, very large. And so the coordination number associated with complexes of this larger ligand right here is going to be generally smaller than the coordination number of um, complexes involving this smaller phosphine ligand because it takes up less space so we can fit more of them around a given metal center, right? The third factor is the most interesting and the newest and perhaps the least intuitive, electronic structure. The arrangement and the number of ligands around a metal center can affect the electronic energies of the d-electrons in the metal center. And we'll dig into this in more detail when we discuss crystal field theory in the new, near future. But for the time being, it's just worth noting that this is a very important factor for complex geometry in a coordination chemistry complex. And it's new. We're not used to the idea that the number of bonds can change the orbital structure of a molecule, right? But we're going to introduce this notion with coordination complexes and see how crystal field theory can be used to explain complex geometry and account for complex geometry on some level by essentially answering the question on this slide. How does the ligand geometry and the number of ligands, the coordination number, affect the energies of electrons in the complex? So the, coordinate, the geometry of a coordination complex is determined by the coordination number to some extent, but some coordination numbers have multiple possible geometries. Let's start with the smallest possible coordination number, which is 2. That case, we have a linear complex, and this is just Vesper theory in action, right? We've got two ligands. They get as far apart from each other as possible. We end up with a linear geometry. Likewise, for three ligands, to get these as far apart from each other as possible, that corresponds to a trigonal planar geometry with a coordination number of three. With four ligands, or four, a coordination number of four, I should say, coordination number of four, this could be four monodentate ligands or two bidentate ligands, for example, we get, hit our first case where there are two possible geometries. There is the Vesper geometry, tetrahedral, but there is also square planar. And square planar can be advantageous in certain cases based on the number of d electrons. For example, d8 complexes of elements like nickel and palladium commonly assume the square planar geometry. 
In the coordination number of five case, we again have two possible geometries. There's the Vesper geometry of trigonal bipyramidal, and then there's square pyramidal, which again, for electronic reasons, having to do with the number of d electrons and the energies of those electrons, in some cases it's advantageous from an energetic perspective. In other words, the resulting complex is lower in energy when it assumes the square pyramidal geometry rather than TBP. And this is beyond the scope of Vesper theory, and predicting this is not something that we'll worry about in this course, in, in uh, Chem 1212K. But it's just worth noting that here with a coordination number of five, either of these two geometries could be observed. And then with a coordination number of six, the molecular geometry is octahedral. We're back to the familiar Vesper geometry of octahedral when the coordination number is six. And again, this could correspond to six monodentate ligands, three bidentate ligands, one hexadentate EDTA ligand. All of these correspond to a coordination number of six.